All right, it's Benjamin Ray here with Sustainability Live. I'm here with Terry Donnelly, and he is a CEO of Hill Street Beverage Company. They trade on the Canadian on the Toronto Stock Exchange under beer. Very clever name. How are you doing today, Terry? Great, Ben. Thanks for having me uh, join you. It's a pleasure. Yeah, you bet. You know, um, I've got a, a brief story to tell. You know, Terry and I met at a trade show up in Toronto about a year ago. And it, it was kind of this big deal. We went and the, the show producer didn't show up for the first day. All kinds <laughs> of disarray. There ended up being out of, I think, a thousand vendors, maybe 20 who were there and probably less, you know, people came to the trade show. But the good thing about it was we were able to spend a lot of time talking. So it ended up being a very good meeting, but it was a really crazy thing those three days. Literally the world's worst trade show. It was really, really horrendous. <laughs> But uh, nonetheless, you 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 turn some of those uh, little little things you people you meet into real nuggets. So uh, yeah, it was it was good to spend yeah. time talking with you, you and your plans. Yeah. And yeah. you know, you you really have come a long way. Uh, I mean, personally, in your company, you guys do a lot of volunteer work, a lot of donations, uh, very involved in philanthropy. But the most exciting news that I want to talk to you about today is the acquisition of Lixaria Can Farm and really how that is a sustainable play for you. And let's just jump right into that with my first question is about, tell us about that. And then I'd love for you to get in to the differentiating factors regarding shelf stability and why it's such a breakthrough. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, so a little bit, you know, Hill Street is a company that began its life on this world of philanthropy. It began, the company began originally producing a private label line of non-alcoholic beverages for Mothers Against Drunk Driving. Mm. So it was designed as a philanthropic entity mm. uh, to generate revenues for the, the noble cause that Mothers Against Drunk Driving is pursuing. And, um, you know, the, the, the issue with that, of course, is that um, it's really challenging to, you know, celebrate a bottle of champagne with um, even if it's non-alcoholic champagne, when the label and the brand reminds you of grieving mothers and yeah. <laughs> car accidents and drunk drivers and all those terrible things that are associated with that. So the, the business didn't quite work. So when they asked me to take it over, what we realized is this company had created literally the world's first and best tasting non-alcoholic wine and beer. And the pivot that we designed for them, for the shareholders at the time was that the government will never allow cannabis and alcohol to coexist in the same product. So if we could find a way to put cannabis into the non-alcoholic wine and beer, we'd probably have an opportunity at a market that's many times larger than the market for non-alcoholic wine and beer for, mm. for traditional non-alcoholic uh, adult beverages. And so we started down this path of finding ways to get cannabis into these amazing tasting beverages without screwing up the taste. And that's where we found Luxaria. Hmm. And Luxaria has developed a breakthrough, an absolutely brilliant drug delivery system that not only works on cannabis, it also works on non steroidal anti inflammatories like Tylenol, it works on pain medications, it works on vitamins, worked on hmm. antiretrovirals and biologicals wow. and all these different things. And so they had developed this amazing system that allows you to convert active molecules into. A powder and most of these active molecules come in an oil they're in a they're in a fat and oils don't dehydrate they don't dry out they they stay you cook with olive oil at the bottom of the pan after sitting in your oven for an hour you still got oil sitting at the bottom of the pan right and so these guys actually have a breakthrough way to convert oil into a dry powder without creating a new molecule mm. so the cannabis molecule if it's used for cannabis, stays as a cannabis molecule and gives you all of the benefits that would come from consuming that in other forms. It's just that you've put it into a dry substrate like sugar or flour or tapioca, cocoa, coffee, tea, and pretty much any kind of food powder or powdered food ingredient, dried fruits, vegetables, dried meat, milk, wow. dairy, you name it, eggs. Uh, can now be infused with cannabis. And the, the brilliant thing is that when you do that, the infusion adopts the substrate, the properties of the substrate. So if we infuse into sugar, 
which is what this is. This is a, a, a cannabis infused sugar. Hmm. Um, you get the stability of sugar with the physical attributes of cannabis. And what's super amazing about that cannabis is it retains, it bypasses the liver. So when you consume it, this is one of the biggest problems of, of cannabis is that you consume it, it goes into the liver, it takes somewhere from 40 minutes to four hours for the liver to process it, release it into your bloodstream. And in doing so, it changes the chemical structure of the cannabis from delta nine to 11 hydroxy. So you're, you're saying that this actually bypasses the liver. Completely. So, so it completely changes the game for let's say edibles. Exactly. So you can feel the effect within two minutes. Huge. It retains the same feeling you get as though you smoked or vaped, right? So it feels like you smoked or vaped cannabis, not that you ate it and had that body long lasting, you know, 16 hour uh, intoxicating journey that comes from taking a lot of gummies and edibles. Um, so you get that sort of two to three hour intoxicating experience that you get from smoking or vaping, but you consumed it orally and you can consume it in literally any form. So, so we have, you know, all these different things we're experimenting with. And I, I made these in my kitchen last night. These are uh, gummies hmm. that are made with our non-alcoholic wine. So wow. super sophisticated wine gum flavored products. So are those like, like champagne gummies? These, these are champagne gummies. Yeah. Exactly. Wow. Right. And, and they taste like champagne. They're, they're delicious. And they've got the cannabis infusion huh. that we use basically by just adding the sugar, which you do as a syrup inside the gummy. And then you dissolve it and put it in a mold and let it set overnight. And, uh, and they, they are absolutely uh, fabulous tasting. And, and the nice thing is that unlike any other cannabis product that is made traditionally, these don't degrade in potency over time because they adopted the characteristics, the stability of the sugar, so they don't lose their potency. So as long well, as they're that's properly, a huge, that's a huge thing it's, also, it's, right? It's For a huge supply, thing. It's, that's that's it's, a huge breakthrough. It, absolutely. So the, the stability part and the sustainability that comes from this technology is not just in what happens to you when you consume it, but Right now in Canada, there's, according to Health Canada, the government, there's over 900,000 kilograms of dried flour that's unpackaged sitting in inventory. And dried flour of cannabis loses its potency within one year. 100% of its potency is gone. 100% so is gone. 100% is gone within one year. If it's converted to oil, it loses 40 to 50% potency a year. So if you have a bucket of cannabis oil that you've extracted, six months later, it's got 25% less potency. Six months after that, 25% less potency. That means it's got 25% less value. And so this completely changes that game as changes well. Changes the game completely because you can now take this unpackaged inventory, convert it to oil, change it into literally any form of powder that you would like flour, sugar, cocoa, coffee, tea, you know, dried fruits and vegetables, et cetera, et cetera. And, and you can then store it. And so for a lot of companies that have debt covenants that basically say, you got to maintain this much inventory in order to have the value of your inventory equal the amount we've loaned, lent loan to you. These companies have to literally keep cultivating and throw out the old inventory and keep producing new stuff just to. Well, make that's it. not sustainable at, at all. And not in the slightest. It's a huge waste. Huge waste of resources, of people, of material, fertilizers, water, lighting, energy, all these kinds of things. You know, you need size and scale to produce enough because it perishes. It's such a perishable product uh, that declines in value at greater than 100% a year. So, so this is a. A, a real breakthrough from a wholesale development standpoint. Um, it, it, it allows these companies to maintain 100% of the value of their inventory almost indefinitely. You know, if you have sugar, this will re lose, you know, its potency at 0.2% per year. 
right? So 1% over five years. And obviously you want your product turned, you want it sold through, but you can now control and manage your inventory without worrying about this rapid decay in value that leads these cannabis companies to, to write off. I, I saw one company posted their quarterly numbers, and this is not a big company. This is, you know, I would call it a small to medium sized cannabis company. You have to write off $11 million worth of inventory in one quarter. 11 million. 11 million. And then and they what, have to what keep, happens to to keep producing it. It just it, it, it hits the compost. Wow. It gets burned. It gets, you know, they sell it for pennies a ton as hemp fiber to make hemp concrete or other items like that. But but it's 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 just a huge waste of resources to continually be cultivating just to maintain your debt covenants. And wow. so we hope this solution can can have some broad impact. Um we're going to start looking for places that can work with us to use this technology to create those shelf stable ingredients that that not only uh, allow manufacturers to better control their inventory, but also give consumers a better experience. Right. A more predictable experience. You know, we had a, a question here about the recipes, and I want to go back to that with your your gummies. I saw a couple comments come up on here about that. Uh, yeah. Question uh, from Rachel. So it helps support different food recipe formulations. Absolutely. I mean, if you can think of an ingredient that is a powder, right? Flour, cornstarch, tapioca, cayenne pepper, um, you know, dried coffee or tea, cocoa, sh any form of sugar. This is this is actually um, a golden sugar. Huh. Uh, and I have others that are dextrose and uh, demerara. Uh, so different sugars that you can infuse and it retains all of the attributes of that. So it, it you know, it has the same feel. It, it, it's, it's, you know, bakes the same way, can be used in the same method. Um, but of course, it doesn't, it's, it's it doesn't affect how you would bake or anything about that. You anything you know yeah. the difference. Yeah. And, and also it's, you know, that if you think of this amount um, so I, I took a gram of oil that I purchased and I converted it into powder in my kitchen using this method, which is completely organic and, and literally has three ingredients, cannabis oil, you know, high oleic sunflower oil and a substrate, which in this case is dextrose. And, and so using this process, you know, you end up with two jars of this from one gram of oil. Wow. And so instead of dabbing and smoking a gram of oil over the course of two or three nights, like a normal cannabis user would do, you turn that one gram of oil into a hundred servings of 10 milligrams each hmm. or 500 servings of two milligrams each. So you can really accurately dose and use literally every milligram of active material uh, to put it to good use. Right. So instead of burning it and burning from Rachel about that specifically is yeah. is, is uh, confusion is from flour or from distillate kind of this is from oil okay uh, so this is from cannabis oil and and we can use distillates or isolates but we can also use live rosin we can use crude oil um, so there there's no need to go through the expensive process of creating isolates or distillates um, and what about for CBD. Same with CBD well, has exact so cannabis and cannabis oil and hemp oil are molecularly identical. One just has the THC cannabinoid and the other one doesn't. Um, so the the physical structure of the oil is identical. I mean this this in is fact, huge in fact this this is experience. This, this is a drink mix made by Luxaria. Ah. Um, and so if you if you look at this product, um, this is a Luxaria product. It's a drink mix that's a CBD powder. And it's made from multi-spectrum hemp oil, and uh, they use lactose as the um, as the sugar. Uh, and the reason why they chose lactose is that it, when you put it in a bottle of water, it becomes milky. Hmm. And, and they thought, you know, that would be a good signal to a consumer that there's something in the water. Oh, okay. You know, if you look at if you look at these, they're very clear, right? So they're literally nice crystal clear gummies so you can create infusions that are crystal clear but you can also use different ingredients to create uh 
uh, different outcomes, different ways of, of working. So whether it's, you know, dried fruits or dried meat, you know, cereal grains, uh, any of those items can be uh, infused and turn into either a CBD infused or a THC infused ingredient for then turning into a finished consumer product. So for the for the consumer, it completely changes the game in many ways. So the the efficacy or or it affects you quick more quick quick <laughs> faster because yeah. uh, it bypasses the liver. It's more predictable yeah. and yeah. you can put it in very varying um, yeah. recipes to be able to experience on a much different level. Absolutely. And, and, and it works equally well as a topical as it does as an edible. So you still get that rapid onset through topical uh, ingredients as well. We're focusing on the edible side of things, but if somebody was interested in buying the ingredient to use for topicals, we can certainly accommodate that. And um, and so we're, we're really excited about integrating this acquisition. You know, we just closed it last Wednesday, so it's only been a few days since we uh, closed the acquisition. There's 78 patents issued or pending on this technology. Wow. Uh, so it's a really novel and very unique methodology that nobody had done before. Um, and so it's it's got really broad ramifications. And uh, and it's a very it's a very organic, very uh, straightforward methodology. But again, it's a it's a very unique one. And what we love about it is is that it can be conduct you can you can process the cannabis oil using entirely organic ingredients hmm. and it only adds those three ingredients so very clean label no unpronounceable words on the label <laughs> it's cannabis oil sunflower oil and whatever powder you used to to uh, conduct the process so you know exactly what's going into your body you can That's understand true. the dosing there won't yeah. be side effects based on whatever else is in there you can't pronounce yeah, and and a, and a legal dose in Canada. So we're you know up in Canada. So that's ten milligrams is the maximum. So that doesn't even add one calorie. So not even one calorie to any product. So whatever there are like our wine, our non-alcoholic wine is incredibly low calorie. It's eighty-five percent fewer calories than wine with alcohol. So this champagne that I use to make these gummies, it's like you know thirty-five calories per serving. Normal champagne is is ten times that. Yeah, um, and and so the red wine is like eighteen calories a serving, or Chardonnay is twenty seven calories a serving. So if you can use that, and you look at one of these things, and you know that's going to be a couple of calories uh, based on the amount of liquid that's in there. That's actually I made you know a, an ice cube tray full of uh, full of gummies with literally equivalent of one glass of wine. Wow, that's wow. That that so, is huge. Well, you yeah. mentioned you're in in Canada. Yeah. Um, what are your plans for for growth? Where are you going? What about Europe? What about states? Everywhere else? So we have you know the global rights to this technology and uh, ex exclusively. Uh, we're super excited about that. We're going to be licensing the technology to different manufacturing partners in Europe, and in the U.S. and Australia. So we're already beginning that process of setting up those relationships uh, you know with with uh, conversations that are well underway and so we expect to have commercial partners around the world that will be using the technology that we are and then we have you know we'll obviously in Canada we'll be selling the ingredients from our processing facility and our processing partners like co-packers and people that have different things there's there's a couple of companies that produce gummies for the legal cannabis market there's beverage co-packers, there's chocolate co-packers that now exist. And so they're kind of the ideal place that we would work with to create the specific ingredient that's a chocolate company, we can infuse the cocoa, hmm. right? Yeah, with a wine company, um, you can actually infuse tannins, right? So we can take powder to tannins, infuse the tannins, and then you put that into a non-alcoholic wine. Or we can use sugar. Um, with with a, a gummy company, we could infuse the gelatin or the de or the pectin, right? We could infuse the sugar that they use, or sorbitol or xylitol or any of those other sweeteners that can be used, which are very traditional in the production of gummies. Um, so so there's a, a tremendous amount of uh, potential for us. Um, you know, we have quite a few inquiries already kind of coming up from us from the U.S. 
to look at the CBD market and the THC market in those states where it's recreationally legal. So we're we're very excited about um, you know kind of digesting all of those potential partnerships and kind of selecting where we begin first and and getting some uh, commercial arrangements uh, underway as soon as possible. So this can, cannabis 2.0, you're really diving into that and it's and it's expanding yeah. way farther than the current kind of 2.0. Absolutely. Um, you know, if you think of of you know the the potential for CBD products as regular consumer products, because CBD is really it's it's a it's a you know it's almost a vitamin like in its response in your body. It just makes you broadly speaking healthier. Yeah. Um, and so as a, as an addition, you can have CBD infused breakfast cereals or granola bars or chocolate bars or any of these kinds of things that will just help uh, your body kind of function to its fullest potential. Um, and, and then with the recreational product, you can start really getting into almost any form factor of beverage, of edible, you know, the traditional ones, brownies, butter tarts, uh, the cookies, um, you know, soft chews like these, um, you know, just a, a really broad array of, of potential products. Uh, we plan on selling these kinds of packets, um, you know, these these little packets, both as neutral products. So this is a completely odorless, tasteless ingredient that you can literally put into anything hmm. um, or flavored instant cocktail type products, you know, where you get a mango lime drink mix in a little package and add it to some sparkling water and there's your cocktail for the evening and and it's got that nice amount of intoxicant where you can really judge and really feel exactly how intoxicated you're getting so you can manage your evening accordingly so uh, much more predictable experience for the user you're absolutely not surprised yeah. And it's, and it's, you know, the, I think the future of the cannabis industry is going to be in creating these socially acceptable forms that give people an alternative to alcohol, right? They, they give people uh, the ability to, to really kind of not have to step nine meters from the entrance of the building and vape something or smoke something. You can literally um, sit at the table and enjoy, you know, I, I, I sort of look at, these kinds of products, right? And, and you go, you know, go to a concert when we get to do that again, when things get back to normal and you go to a concert and your favorite band is gonna play and the lights come down and you open up a little package and you pop one of these in your mouth. And literally five minutes later, before they finish the first song, you're feeling great. And that lovely intoxicating feeling lasts a couple hours till the end of the concert. And then you're able to go home. So not 24 hours. Exactly. <laughs> so you won't wake up and have to worry about driving to work. Right. And being intoxicated. And you didn't have to spend 20 bucks on a glass of beer in an overpriced stadium. Right. You just right. pull something out of your pocket and pop it and have a glass of water and you're having a wonderful time. Right? You know, the, um, the beverage market, speaking of that, has, has taken a little bit longer than we all thought it would over the past couple of years. Yeah. So how, how long do you think it'll be before kind of mainstream gets used to this type of technology and fully embraces it as an alternative to, to alcohol? Well, you know, we're lucky being in the beverage industry and being in Canada because we have a fully federally legal system, right? And what's happening in Canada is a little bit different than in the U.S. in that in Canada we have the big, big players in the beverage place, Constellation Brands, Molson Coors, AB InBev, they've all made massive investments into the cannabis, cannabis beverage sector. So what's happening is a mainstreaming of cannabis beverages driven by the marketing horsepower of these massive companies that are putting big bets on beverages. So we've seen in Canada as of October, the beverages category in BC and Alberta, the two markets that are, that are most advanced the beverage category grew to 23% of the edibles segment. Wow. Now compare that to the US where it's one and a half percent. And and that's literally from launch the first month, the lowest it's been is about 3%. But by October of this year, it had grown to 23% of the edible segment. And, and the amazing thing is, 
I still personally have yet, and I've tried every beverage that I can get my hands on to just do competitive intelligence. And I personally have yet to taste a beverage I really want to buy a second time. Hmm. The experiences were fine. Like the way that you feel, you know, they take a half an hour before you feel the effect. And then some of them lasted six hours from one beverage, right? And, and I think that, you know, that still is problematic for a lot of consumers who just want to have a glass of wine at lunch and be able to go back to work and be able to drive home at the end of the day. Right. And so if you have a cannabis beverage at lunch and you six hours later, you know, you're still feeling the effects, you can't get behind the wheel of a car. So, so I think we can, you know, really help to elevate the consumer experience with sophisticated flavors, with flavors that match um, what people are looking for from a palate standpoint, you know, that, that sophistication that comes from artisanally produced wine and craft beer, uh, and it really elevates not just the taste, but, but the way that you feel as well and, and gives people a more predictable and, and, uh, you know, a better physical response to the products on the market. So we plan on launching, you know, we're weeks away from launching our first products, which are made with our non-alcoholic wine. And we, we've given, uh, we planned with launching with spritzers, like a wine spritzer. So we're, we're excited about where that's going to go. And then the rest of our product formats, including things that we're experimenting with, like you might see these coming out in the next, uh, next fiscal year as well. So we're, we're kind of excited about how these work made with our non-alcoholic wines. So really sophisticated, delicious tasting products. Yeah. Where, so when, when those come out, your spritzer, where will consumers be able to buy those? Canadian consumers will be able to buy them through licensed cannabis stores. Initially, they'll be at the OCS, which is the Ontario Cannabis Store. That's the uh, monopoly wholesaler in Ontario, but it's also the only e-commerce option. So it's the only online place you can buy. There's about 300 cannabis stores in Ontario, and we hope they're all, they're all privately owned. We hope that they pick up the products and carry them, uh, but because they're all independently decide which products to carry, but the government has agreed to list them. Uh, we hope that we'll be launching into the other provinces as soon as we can get the proper production and distribution schedule, you know, that kind of rhythm, you know, of, of producing, delivering the wine and getting it produced and getting it out to the stores. Uh, so it'll take us a few months to get that sort of rhythm properly understood and, and you know, instruct. Uh, and integrated with our co-packer. It's it's exciting. I'm looking forward to seeing them on the shelves here. Yeah, so we're we're really learn, excited about it. Someone wants to learn more about the technology behind this. Do you yeah. have white papers? How how can people learn more about this amazing kind of breakthrough technology? Well, I think anyone can email me directly. Uh, they can reach out to me on LinkedIn. So I'm very easy to find on LinkedIn. And certainly emailing me at terry at hillstreetbevco.com. Uh, Terry, T-E-R-R-Y, at hillstreetbevco.com. Uh, it's probably the fastest and easiest way I respond to every email I get. Um, I'm not one of those guys that lets them accumulate in the inbox. I actually have a zero inbox policy, so every email I get, I respond to. No, and I, I can I can attest to that. Very responsive, um, yeah. very, uh, knowledgeable about it. anything that you guys want to know. Terry's definitely on the forefront of this this uh, this technology area. That. Thank you. Appreciate that. Yeah, you bet. Yes. So the, but the key thing is, you know, going back to sort of the consumer and, and being, we're, we're really focused as consumer marketers on what consumers want and, and what they want is they want taste and experience that gives them products they really love to drink and then products that deliver a very predictable experience. And finally, they want to feel good that the product they're consuming isn't harming the environment, that it's actually... A company has taken the care to do the things that they need to do to be as sustainable as they can possibly be and are continually working towards that sustainability goal of having zero net in impact on the environment. And so we think this technology from a sustainability standpoint, from a taste and experience standpoint, um, and th th there's just a, a huge amount of potential. So we're very, very excited about where this is going to take us. Excellent. Well, thank you for your time, Terry. I encourage any of you to get a hold of Terry, ask him questions, and uh, look forward to seeing your products on the shelf coming up soon. Thank you very much, Ben. It's been a pleasure chatting with you today. All right. We'll talk to you soon. Thank you.